Hello fellow YouTubers, and welcome to what is now the third installment in our Canock Map video series. Now the first video we talked about the basics of the Canock Maps and how, you know, digital circuits worked and all that. Well, not how they work, but how they're represented by means of Boolean equations and such. Second video we expanded on that and we touched the standard approach for five and six parallel maps and talked about some of the limitations on Carnock maps in general. Now, I'm not going to say that nobody has researched this. I'm sure that there's a lot of research on this. It's a very old topic. And maybe this, this approach I'll just talk to you about has already been done. I wouldn't be too surprised since it seemed very, very convenient to me. Now, uh, the important thing to me, however, is um, since it seems so convenient, I'd rather just share it. Um, I won't really claim ownership. If somebody else did it before, just um, send me the reference and I'll be glad to add it in the descriptions. But I will say that I came to this um, on my own. Okay? So, without further ado, let's just get right back into the action. Now, five literals. Well, let's try this whole thing again. So, what happens if instead of having those four literal knock maps back to back, we have them side by side? We just repeat the coordinates. We introduce a new letter to the columns. And we have two identical looking maps. Okay? Same kind of association and all. Uh, we can't really actually um, work with that, can we? I like it, but my students didn't like it. So let's just try a different approach. What happens if we just try and build a cube? Well, this actually works a lot better than looks, but it takes a long time to draw, and the things that take a long time to draw are not comfortable, and especially if they require any kind of talent. I'm telling you this as a guy who um, who's lines look like asses. This is not useful for two seconds without a ruler. I just want to get something out of the top of my head. This won't work. But the idea is pretty solid. So how do we actually make it work? Well, we split columns in two. We add a column inside a column. Okay? So how does that? Well, now we're going to consider that left and right are neighbors. Um, otherwise, it's just going to work like any other Kronach map, except one left column, one left element within a column can be a neighbor to the other columns that are, are already neighbors to that column, but it can't be a neighbor to a right element of another column. Okay? So if we see two ones within the same column, we group them. And if we don't, we don't group them. So that's a kind of a simple thing, huh? So let's see how this actually pans out. Now, first, I'm going to cover half the map. Okay, all the right columns are gone. All the right parts of the column are gone. And we have a Karnak map. Now we know how to solve this, so let's solve it. Done. Now let's look at the other part. Ah, nice. We solved it. Done. Okay, so let's look at the result. Now this is an incomplete result. So how do we complete it? Well, if we look at the arrows, they're pointing towards neighboring ones. So we're going to expand on powers of two and group. Ah, now we've grouped it, but we I'm pointing towards two ones that seem to be neighbors. But look at this number sequence, 101 and 011. Well, more than one bit changed. Two did. So these are not neighbors. See, two bit, two numbers that are on the same left part. Let's just say that we have um, right under zero one zero column and a zero one row. We have the left and right part, so that was grouped. But in this case, these belong to different columns, and they're not even the same left or the same right section of the column, so we can't group them. They seem to be nearby, but at best it'd be distant cousins. Okay? They're not really brothies. They're just... Let's just say they are in the same neighborhood, but they're not neighbors. Okay? So, what happens when we want to introduce six literals? 
Well, we're just going to take the C, put it in the rows, and add a little F to our column denominators. And yes, we're going to copy the exact same number sequence down to our rows. Done. Now we just added a new dimension. So what does that mean? Well, that just means that within each cell of our Kernoff map, we now have a two-input Kernoff map. Okay? So how do we solve a two-input Kernoff map? We saw that in video one. But let's see an example. Okay. We have a huge cell. Um, seems kind of intimidating, but what if we do the exact same and start with just one coordinate? And we have normal Kernoff map. So we solved it. Ah, so let's try the next coordinate. We have normal Kernoff map. All of these ones are isolated. Okay, solved. Next. Ah, another Kernoff map. Solved. Next. Next. Okay, so this is the preliminary result. Now we can already have a good idea of which of these sets are going to actually be grouped again and which aren't, right? Well, let's see. Only those two are grouped. Again, you know, an upper part can match another upper part, their neighbors, or it can be it can be a neighbor of the downward part of the same exact cell. Okay? So it's just um, it's just important to be consistent and if we're consistent, this isn't really much of a problem. It's just a Kernoff map within a Kernoff map. So if we just solve the Kernoff, the entire map by sections, and then just take into account what parts are within that, and add that to our, all, to our solution, it really isn't that much big of a deal. It's just the same thing we were doing before, except that we're talking about six literals, and um, we're using a fraction of the space we needed to present this. Okay. So what happens when we want seven literals? Well, it's more of the same. We're just going to split our columns again. And now we have a three variable Kernoff map per cell. We already know how to manage this. And since I already showed you how to actually get to results, I'll just um, talk about this and then give you an example and solve it. Okay? So this is the number sequence. Uh, um, I've actually had to insert a table because. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of squares here, <laughs> so I needed this to be readable, and I'm thinking that um, the YouTube, uh, the video is going to get a little bit of compression. I'm not even sure if you're going to be able to read the row numbers, but you already know them from the previous examples. So let's just go ahead and do something. Now I didn't put in, the, I didn't just write down the zeros, just ignore them. The reason I didn't write down the zeros is because I wanted this to be. Um, easy to see, okay? Easy on the eyes. So how do we group this? Well, group them like that, okay? Powers of two, blah, 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 blah. Now I have some of them within um, an orange circle. I put them within these orange circles so that you would notice, you know, these guys are pretty much ungroupable, okay? So. The ones that are groupable or grouped, we have the red squares. Those are neighbors, remember, the top and bottom neighbors. And since they're both in the upper coordinates to the leftmost, they're neighbors. We have that huge green thing. Well, if everything's a neighbor, we group it as long as it's a power of two. So nothing new, nothing special. But the one thing that's going to be changing is this is the last example I'm going to be giving you guys because of basic restrictions. I'm not sure how much resolution we're going to have, so I'm just considering this is about the edge. Okay, so what happens when we want eight literals? Well, you don't get an exercise, but other than that, we just split our rows again. Hmm. So this is an entire Kernoff map per cell. So we have a second generation Kernoff map, right? But what else happens? Nothing. Everything is the same. Now I took a quarter of the complete Kernoff map just to show you how it would look. Now these are just four cells of a normal Kernoff map. 
and within these four, each of these four cells is a 16 cell Cranach matter. Okay, so this is how it looks with eight literals. Now, before I continue, eight literals means eight bits. Eight bit means embedded systems. We can now actually do embedded system design. Of course, it'll take a little bit of time and it'll take a lot of drawing, but I've done it and it's not huge. It's kind of acceptable. Um, this can solve 8-bit designs. So nine literals. We start. We still want more. Okay. I don't know. Maybe that carry bit or whatever. But we want more. So how do we do it? Well, we introduce rows to our columns. And now we have a Kronach map inside the embedded Kronach map. So that would. That's interesting, right? So how does this look? Well, same section. Here. Okay, so we want 10. Well, we'll introduce contour rows. And let's look at what this looks like. Okay, this is the top left section. As we can see, it's getting kind of crowded here, but it's still feasible. Now, 10 bits means a lot of um, analog to digital controllers come in 10 bits. It's a pretty useful number. So what happens if we want 11 literals? Well, this isn't a one-trick pony. Um, we now split our column rows again. So let's see, 12 literals? Hmm. Well, this is a little bit weird, but it works. Well, the problem we have here is we have a Kernoff map within the Kernoff map within the Kernoff map. We're just looking at one cell. Can this be done? Sure. On the blackboard, I don't see any problems. I have to start asking, why would you actually want to do this? 12 literals. 10, I understand. 12, okay, maybe you had some kind of strange idea. So, 13. Well, why not? But now we're going to start stacking things. And the way we're going to stack them is by making another split. And the thing is, we've already split our columns into other columns and into other rows, and now we're going to be repeating that split. I find it a little bit uncomfortable. We can actually try to find some other way of doing it. I haven't really thought of one. Uh, that doesn't include where I'll be talking about later. But you know, if you want to, okay, go for it, find something. So that's pretty much it. Well, yes and no, we, we can continue and splitting things and all that. But you know, as we already said, oh, as I already said, um, we've, we've um, extinguished our axis. This is pretty much it with this logic. We're now repeating things. We're now bifurcating. Well, let's look at the chart of bifurcation. By the way, this is um, common domain chart. Bifurcation means splitting things in two constantly. Well, this eventually leads into, well, this is one of the more many um, case studies of chaos. In our case, we don't get chaos. Our lines won't intersect, but we do get complexity. And complexity leads to tediousness, which leads to human error. So are we calling it a day? Well, not really. But we'll tackle this problem from another angle in the next video. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll see you again soon.